As we're getting started, um, just a reminder that all of our TM and Tuesday events are um, supported by the, the Master Naturalist program, which is um, supported by federal funding. And we would love for you to be able to um, contribute to the survey that helps contribute to our uh, the continuation of these events for the Master Naturalist program and other events um, that we offer. Um, so, if you um, you can take this at any time, um, we'd like to show it at the beginning and then we'll have it again at the end for you too. Uh, as a reminder, we are here for a special event, a uh, special mini series event in our TMN Tuesdays um, series. And this today we're coming um, to you with Craig Hensley from our Texas Nature Trackers program and he's here to talk about a um, a new project opportunity for master naturalists. Um, if you can go back to that, that slide, uh, Craig, with all of the webinar etiquette. It's right there. Is that the right one? That one, yes. Yep. Just a little yep. bit of delay. So um, same, this, even though this is a, a, ser a new series um, or a kind of a one-time, two-time series with the master naturalist program of our, our TMN Tuesdays, it's an offshoot. Um, we have the same webinar etiquette and the same advanced training um, information for this TMN Tuesday mini series event. Um, we are using WebEx, so if you're experiencing issues with WebEx, please refer to the WebEx guide. Um, that uh, there's a link there, and I think we'll get it dropped in the chat here in a second. Um, the chat function is open for on topic discussion um, related to this webinar. Please be professional and respectful in all your comments and questions in the chat room. Uh, as with all of our TMN Tuesday events, um, oh, I'm sorry, the session, this session is a special session. So it will run up about two hours. It may not last the whole two hours, um, but we are estimating today about two hours for this session. Um, you can count uh, advanced training time for the total amount of time the session runs or the total amount of time that you watch it. Um, the recording will be posted to our website by the end of tomorrow um, at the latest. And um, as a reminder, as with all of our TMN Tuesday events, um, our TMN Tuesday events, including this one, can be watched, the recording can be watched for AT also. Um, attendees are not able to unmute during the WebEx event. Please use the chat box to ask any questions. And as a reminder, we will um, have questions, hold questions in the chat box and then moderate them um, towards the end of the presentation when we open it up for Q&A. Um, we will begin with moderating questions from the chat box. Um, one other thing about chat and questions, um, Wendy Anderson, the our other uh, Texas Nature Trackers biologist is online today also as a panelist and will be helping to answer any questions that she can help answer in the chat as we go along also. All right, next, next slide. So um, I'm really excited about this today's team and Tuesday mini series with the Texas Nature Trackers program. Um, this is a project that uh, my family tested um, and tested the protocol for uh, back in November. And so we're, we're, I'm just really excited about it because I've already been a part of it. Um, and it was fun. It was fun to do as a family, um, fun to provide that service. And I think it's something that you're all of our master naturalists and our chapters are really going to enjoy. Um, really easy to implement um, and exciting to see what you get back as well as you're contributing data to our overall project and process. Um, our presenter today is Craig Hensley. He is one of our Texas Nature Trackers program biologists. Um, and this, this bat project has been a brainchild of his. Oh gosh, when did you start working on this one, Craig? Uh, a while back, <laughs> several, <laughs> several months ago. Several, uh, several months ago, last yes, year, yeah, um, yeah, probably yeah. about this time last year, uh, started thinking about this project. So it's been a labor of love, um, finally coming to a point where we can share it with master naturalists and um, get get you involved um, on the landscape in collecting um, acoustic monitoring uh, details and stats for um, bats across Texas. 
um, to help with several of our our species coming that which Craig will tell you about. So I think that's my last slide. Craig, you can take the I don't remember. <laughs> you can take it away from here. <laughs> okay. So uh, another slide. There must be a delay in the presentation. Is there? Is that what I'm understanding? Just yeah, a little bit. Let's see if I can. Um, I uh, let's see. I'm trying to think if there's adjustment. I don't know that there is. Okay. All right. Um, oh, oh, did, yeah. Did, so this was one slide. Um, again, as a reminder, this is a mini series in our regular TMN Tuesday event. Uh, that we offer each year. This is just a promo slide talking about uh, all of the TMN Tuesday events we have scheduled so far for 2024. Um, we mentioned this being a mini series, the beginning of uh, two items that the Texas Nature Trackers program will be bringing to us. So um, the first one is today with Craig, and then the second one is coming up next month in February for the iNaturalist Train the Trainer workshop um, for T for the Texas Nature Trackers program. There's a lot of Texases and natures and <laughs> we're talking about today that get jumbled in um, uh, in my saying. So, um, this the next event in this mini series will prepare master naturalists to help give iNaturalists um, workshops and um, help prepare others in their local community for bio blitzes and contributing um, uh, iNaturalist observations um, to our TNT projects. So that's that's a very high level overview promo of the next series, um, the next event in this series. So, and then to take it away with the actual project for today. All right, Craig. All righty. So is that screen popped up? With the agenda, I'm trying to figure out the delay. Why there's yeah, a yes. delay? Okay, yep. okay. Um, so first of all, thank you for uh, the opportunity to do this, Michelle, and thank you to all of you that are out there across Texas joining uh, us for this presentation today. Um, we have we have indeed been thinking about a, an acoustic monitoring project for bats for for quite some time, and today we want to share uh, what we've come up with. And uh, also to let you know that this is going to be a work in progress, especially this first year. And so all of you that get involved uh, are going to be right along with me uh, in the learning process. And, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to, over the course of this first year, refine what we're doing and, and uh, see it, see it uh, evolve into something that's a very tight program that can go on for a long period of time. Uh, with our program with the uh, Texas Master Naturalist for the benefit of bats across the state of Texas. So today our agenda is going to be to um, uh, give you a little bit of an overview about the bats of Texas. Um, I know a lot of you are already uh, well educated on the bats of Texas, but I also know that there could be some people that are new to the Master Naturalist program or don't know a lot about bats. So we're going to try to provide a little bit of both. So hopefully you'll learn a little bit of natural history as well as about this project and what we're doing. We're gonna uh, actually spend a little time kind of showing you where bats are in Texas, uh, in particular in comparison to where your chapters are across the state so that you know or get an idea of how you can contribute to um, uh, this research effort that's gonna be ongoing. And we're gonna also introduce you to an organization called NABAT, um, and we'll tell you more about that when we get to them. This is a large organ North American organization that we're working with and, and, and partner with uh, on this particular project. We're gonna talk a little, obviously, about acoustic monitoring, what it is, how you do it, um, and then uh, take a look at how you all can become engaged and involved in this project. Uh, and then what are the, the next steps that we have to uh, get this thing kicked off and moving. So. Um, uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of information on, on the bats of Texas, of course, bats are known as Chiroptera, which means hand winged. It's the only true flying mammal. They, I love these two photographs side by side. You can see the skeleton that has the large fingers, uh, and even the thumb up there. And then of course, a photograph of what is a pallid bat where you can see the bones of the, of the arm and the fingers, uh, between the two layers of skin in that particular photograph. 
So when we talk about bats, there are basically two different kinds of bats. One is uh, our, that one is known as the micro bats. And just so that you can laugh at me, it's uh, Vespertiliona formis. Uh, uh, you try to say that three times. Uh, but those are the bats that we have here in Texas. It's all of our bats. Um, they all echolocate, which is our advantage for this type of project. They all have a claw only on their thumb, whereas the bats that um, are called the terop to, uh, pteropodiformes, pteropodiformes, or mega bats, um, those are the large bats, and most of those are the fruit bats. Some of them have wingspans exceeding two feet. Um, and um, the majority of them actually don't lo uh, echolocate. So what we're doing is kind of unique to the bats that we have in, in, uh, in Texas. So when we're talking about echolocation, of course, with bats, they, the bats are emitting high frequency sounds, most of which for most species we cannot hear with our ears. We have to use modified equipment to be able to pick up those sounds. Uh, their, their individual call notes that they send out can go out about 65 feet. And of course, they use those echolocation calls for navigation to avoid obstacles in capturing prey, of course. And one of the really cool things about these echolocation calls that I've always find, found fascinating is that they can determine distance, direction, velocity, shape, size, and texture of their prey based on the, the, the return uh, signals that come back to them. And of course, they have a variety of pulses, and that is what is one of the big challenges that any bat expert or non-expert that's trying to figure out what they are hearing, um, those calls vary for different purposes, and they vary not only for the purpose, but also in terms of the behavior and then in the number of pulses per second. So for example, if you've ever been around a bat detector uh, that was actually playing live, and you heard the individual pulses going out there, that's where they're moving around foraging. And as a, the number of pulses per second increase, that's when they're typically getting closer and closer to the prey, where then you end up with what almost sounds like a buzz and a pop. And that pop is when uh, they've apparently grabbed that insect out of the air. When they echolocate, uh, bats can use uh, emit the sounds either through their nose or through their mouth. And you'll see that on this particular bat, we don't have any bats that have real big nose leaves like that. Um, but that particular bat can use that nose leaf to help uh, guide that sound out. Uh, the ears of bats um, are really uh, highly defined structures with lots of wrinkles and different shapes. They have that thing called a tragus that also helps with vertical sound detection. So they are one really highly modified machine uh, animal for um, being able to do the work that they do out in, in the natural world. That said, keep in mind that bats can see as well, if not better than humans. So a lot of those stories of being bats being blind, that's absolutely not true. They have eyes, they can see very well, um, but they use one because so many of them or most of them are hunting at night, obviously the echolocation um, uh, adaptation comes in handy. So bats, of course, have different seasonal strategies for survival. Um, a lot of some bats migrate. Most when we think of migration, most of us are thinking of birds and we're thinking of them going south. Well, some bats do go south, like our Mexican free tail bats. Um, but then other bats actually migrate to the north. So um, that that's uh, the bats do what they do, and they kind of rewrite the books a little bit, if you will, on the on the concept of migration. Other bats, of course, uh, hibernate. They go into a deep torpor where they've reduced their bodily functions, including breathing and heart rate, so that they can actual, uh, actually conserve energy. And they live off stored fat that they've accumulated in the fall pre prior to um, uh, hibernation. And those bats include things like the cave myotis, the pallid bat, the, what's known as the tricolor bat or the American paramyotis. And those are bats now that are actually susceptible to what we'll talk about in a little bit, white nose syndrome, for the very reason that they are hibernating bats. And we'll talk about how that, um, that uh, disease uh, impacts these bats here in just a few moments. And of course, bats can roost in a wide variety of places, whether it's a cave, as, as you see at Old Tunnel or down in Bracken or other places around the state, maybe under an eave of an old building, 
under the bridges, the famous one being there in Austin, of course. But then also there are certain bats that, are, that don't roost together. They roost individually. And they may be sleeping under a leaf like the, that uh, red bat that you see on the right, on the right there, or a uh, cave my or a, a tricolored bat that you see in the middle of that uh, cedar tree uh, trunk uh, roosting right there. So they can they can be in a lot of different places. So I want to talk before we get start getting into the meat of things. I want to talk about something called species of greatest conservation need, and uh, the Texas Nature Trackers program that Wendy and I serve. Our goal is to help get data collected for species of greatest conservation need. And we do that mo primarily through the, the tool iNaturalist, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, if not all, hopefully all of you are familiar with it. Um, but we, we are focused on those species of greatest conservation need or else SGCN. Uh, and those are plants or animals that are in decline or have become rare and are in need of intervention to recover that species for long-term survival. And within the state of Texas, and actually globally, there are ranking systems that are used to say, this species is in trouble, this species is okay. And in the state of Texas, we use what's called an S-rank system. And there are five categories. So S1 is the category called critically imperiled. These are animals or plants where there are very few left they're in very small, isolated locations, and it's very possible that they could become extirpated from the state of Texas um, uh, if steps aren't taken to intervene on their behalf. S2 is considered imperiled. Those have a little bit better populations, but there are still many factors that are keeping their numbers down or decreasing their numbers. Um, fa they're facing big declines and they need inter intervention as well and they need it pretty quickly. Then we have a, kind of a middle category is a vulnerable uh, S3 and these are due to having restricted ranges sometimes, having few populations. Uh, there could be recent declines that we don't, we're not a, that we're not understanding. Uh, there could be other factors that are making that animal or plant considered an S3. And these judgments, by the way, that are made um, are scientifically based. So when an animal is reviewed or a plant is reviewed, they pull together all the scientists, all the experts to try to get as much data as they can that's out there about that species. And then they run it through some classifiers with a, a particular system that um, ranks those species based on the evidence that we have. And this is why and, and uh, that we do this work and try to collect this data like we're gonna be doing with bats because we don't have all the information. And when you practice conservation, one of the things that's important to have is as much information as you can so you, you can determine is the species okay, is the species need help? And if, it's, if we don't have all the information, it makes it more challenging to make good scientific-based uh, decisions on their conservation. So the other two categories are S4 and S5, which is apparently secure, S4 or secure. And these are species that for S4 may not be super common or super abundant, but they seem to be doing well. They seem to be scattered in good population numbers around their entire range. Uh, they don't have um, a lot of concerns uh, associated with them at this time. And then secure are gonna be species, a good example would be the white-tailed deer or the Northern Cardinal. There are species that are doing well. They're abundant. There's no evidence for concern conservation-wise. And so with, with what we're doing and with what our wildlife diversity biologists worry with are those that are between S1 and S3. So those are the three ranks that, we're, that we focus on. However, with this monitoring project, when bats are flying by, they don't, they won't, they're not going to tell you, oh, by the way, I'm an S1 or I'm an S3 or I'm an S5, so don't record me. They're going to record, we're going to record everything. And that will give us good information to confirm that certain bats are doing great. And it may also reveal that we're not picking up bats that we thought should be in that particular area. So it, the, the, this kind of monitoring works for all five of those categories. Um, and um, uh, but we want to focus primarily on our S1 through S3. So what I want to do now is just go through a few of the species of bats in Texas. Uh, some of you are going to be familiar with, some you may not be. 
Um, but we want to start, I want to start with the most common bat in the state of Texas, which is the Brazilian or Mexican free tail bat. Everybody knows about that, I hope. Um, and it is the most common bat in Texas. Estimates vary, but I've heard from 100 million to 50 million. It just depends, but there's a lot of them. Uh, the largest colony of mammals on earth, uh, wild mammals on earth is at Bracken Cave in San Antonio. Um, these are very fast flying, high flying bats. They've been recorded at 10,000 feet. They feed primarily on corn and cotton earworm moths. Um, they are, and so they eat large moths and they eat just incredible amounts of these moths on a nightly basis. So very, very significant bat species for farmers um, and for just for conservation in, in general. They are not an SGCN because they are so common and they are distributed statewide. So I know a lot of you have, uh, some of you have been to Bracken Cave or have seen a bad emergence, but I wanted to play this. This is from uh, our uh, information specialist with our program, uh, Lee Smith, and shot this slow motion video. So I just wanted to share a few seconds of that. So if you haven't been to Bracken Cave, haven't seen this mass um, uh, movement of, of animals, it is uh, beyond spectacular. So I would encourage any of you uh, when you're in San Antonio area and can get to Bracken Cave for one of these emergencies, um, it's pretty spectacular. Uh, and by the way, I don't know if anybody's counted the bats in this video yet, but there's about, I don't know, half a million, um, but I, I have no idea, but there's a bunch. Anyway, so I wanna to move to another bat that has got a statewide distribution. It is also not an SGCN. It's one of our more common bats throughout the state. It is the eastern red bat. Uh, this is a bat that does not roost in colonies or in caves or places like that with uh, like the Mexican free tail bat. So um, I literally found this bat hanging under a leaf on a plant in the middle of the day um, uh, at, at a nature center I used to work at. And um, so they're out there by themselves. And you, the red bats are kind of neat. The females have white pelage. So this is a female. And if you look real carefully, there's this big patch of, of fur right here. That's its tail. It uses that furry tail to kind of wrap itself up to help stay warm. They are a migratory species. They actually give birth, whereas most bats like the Mexican free tail only gives birth to one bat at a time per year. These guys can give, uh, females can give uh, birth to one to five young, quite a few. Um, uh, again, very, very common in our area. One of its cousins is the hoary bat. Now this is a bat that is vulnerable. It's an S3. Um, it actually is another migratory species. It actually gives birth in Northern states. They roost in trees. They don't roost in big colonies. Um, and again, another high flying bat, large moths is, is a, lot, a lot of their di diet. And I can tell you from holding on to them in mist netting efforts before they are one, they have one bad, bad attitude. And those teeth that you see in that photograph uh, can make a nice big hole in your skin if you if you let them. Uh, but this is a, one of the bats that um, has, there are concerns about it in Texas, particularly when it comes to those large areas where we have um, wind generation, uh, wind energy generation, they're highly susceptible to hitting those blades. Um, so that this is a bat that uh, a lot of attention is being given to, uh, not only here in Texas, but across its range. Another um, uh, SGCN that's also a really common bat in Texas, or used to be, <coughs> I should say, is the cave myotis. This is a bat that often will um, roost in large numbers inside caves, that's the name, um, and, uh, and sometimes in conjunction with Mexican free tail bats, but usually separated from them. They are a year round resident in Texas. Um, Big challenge with this bat is that a lot of them have disappeared because of white nose syndrome. And in fact, some of the estimates that are that in some caves there is 90% to 100% disappearance of this bat species in those particular caves. So this is a bat that we are extraordinarily concerned with. Another bat that is also an SGCN that is also potentially uh, could be uh, um, injured population-wise by white nose syndrome is the tricolored or American paramyotis. It's a very small, it's the second smallest bat in the state of Texas. 
if when you see this bat flying around, it looks almost like a big moth or a butterfly kind of fluttering around, not a real strong flight like you'd see from a red bat or a hoary bat or a Mexican free tail bat. And they roost in caves, trees, crevices. Um, and um, this is another bat that is of great concern uh, here in the state of Texas and throughout its range because of, again, because of that disease. Beautiful little thing. Um, the smallest bat, we just showed you the second smallest bat. The smallest bat in Texas is this cutie. This is the canyon bat or American pe peristrail. Here I'm a scientist, I'm saying using the word cute. Um, they weigh in at four grams. And I don't know if you have a gram scale, but four grams is not a lot. Uh, that's my hand. You can see there is not a lot to that bat right there. They are non-migratory. You're gonna find them more in the Western half of Texas as we'll show you on a range map soon, but they are on S3. They're ones that are vulnerable and because they will roost um, in caves and they are hibernators, they have the potential to be impacted by white nose syndrome. Now, going from the smallest bat in Texas to the largest bat in Texas, we have the Western or Greater Western Mastiff bat. There's actually two um, subspecies in the state. Um, uh, they're listed as S2 and S3, depending on the subspecies. So they're bats that we're concerned with. They have a very limited distribution in Southwest, in the Southwest part of the state, um, but they can have wingspan up to 20 inches or more. Uh, they are active year round. They have a call that actually sounds a little bit cardinal-like, so technically we could actually hear that call, um, but a fascinatingly large bat uh, for, for our state. Another Western bat, and we're going to kind of explore Western bats now, uh, and I apologize for that bias to Western bats. That's where I've done most of my uh, netting in the past and work, so I apologize up front for some of the Eastern bats that you're not going to get to see pictures of. Um, but they're there. Uh, the pallid bat is a beautiful yellowish bat. One of the neat things about this bat is that it will it will potentially eat scorpions or um, centipedes from the ground. It's and and the other thing that's been discovered about this particular bat, by the way, which is not an SGCN, um, it is actually a nectar feeding bat. That this was not known until recently. Some researchers were collecting. Uh, or netting bats, and they were finding that these pad pallid bats were covered with uh, pollen. And it turned out to be the pollen, I believe, of the, the desert plant Lechugia from their flowers. So turns out this is a very flexible bat in terms of its diet, uh, which, is, which is pretty cool. And then another bat that was, you noticed, I don't know if you noticed the trend, but the ears are getting bigger. Um, so here's one that's uh, a, literally a big-eared bat called the Townsend's Big-Eared Bat. Uh, it's at another West Texas uh, uh, specialist. Um, they are good, um, uh, really, really kind of neat bats. Those ears make them look kind of freakazoid. They are an S3, they're vulnerable, um, and they are also a hibernating bat. So this is another bat that potentially has uh, we've got concern about in terms of white nose syndrome and just habitat loss in general. So, uh, but a really uh, fascinating looking bat of, of West Texas. And then just to go extreme on ear size, I mentioned that our bats don't really have nose leaves, but they sure, a few of them sure do have big old ears. And this is the spotted bat. It's actually a black bat with white spots on its fur. Um, has the largest ears of any bat in, in North America. I always call it the Dumbo bat because the ears are so enormous. Um, they eat moths, lots and lots of small moths. Almost 100% of their diet is moths. They are considered an S3 or vulnerable, and they are found exclusively in the Chihuahuan Desert in the Big, Big Bend National Park area. And then another West Texas bat that actually, if you looked at this closely and you compared it to a, a Mexican free tail bat, they'd look really similar, except that the ears on this particular bat actually merge in the front of the forehead. Um, this is the pocketed free tail bat. So mentioned to, for two things. One, it has a small fold of skin around the knee on the leg, and it also, its tail, just like the free, Mexican free tail bat, its tail extends beyond the patagium. Medium sized bat. Um, it eats everything from moths to beetles. This was actually only first discovered in Texas in 1967, um, and it is considered a S3 vulnerable species. The ghost face bat, this is one of the 
craziest looking bats I've ever seen. Uh, certainly the craziest one I've ever seen in Texas. It's a fairly large bat. It has that reddish pelage or fur, uh, feeds again, primarily on moths. Uh, and it has a very strange face. That photograph on the lower end, you can see an eyeball where hopefully you can see my pointer. The eyeball right there, another eyeball over there. And here's the mouth right here. And these weird nose, uh, this weird nose and the ears, rounded kind of pointed ears, really strange looking bat. It is considered imperiled, it is an S2. So there's concerns about this species uh, like many of the others. And then I wanna leave you uh, in terms of photographs of bats with uh, a couple of our myotis. We have a lot of myotis bats. We talked already about the cave myotis. Um, but smaller than the cave myotis are these little guys. This is a California myotis. Um, it's very small. It's a late evening bat. Uh, they ro roost in small groups. They are vulnerable, listed as vulnerable, S3, and they are Chihuahuan desert uh, uh, a bat as well. They have kind of that uh, beautiful goldish pelage with kind of blackish dark, dark ears and a dark kind of dark mask. You can't see it quite as well in this um, across the face, which helps identify it. Another one that lives near it and around it is this one. It's called the Yuma myotis. And it's a very pale bat. You'll notice it doesn't have that bright yellowish plumage or uh, pelage. Uh, eats a wide variety of insects. Um, it roosts in a variety, wide variety of places. And it's usually close to water. So along the Rio Grande or its tributaries is where you type, typically find this bat. And this too is an S3 bat. So what I want to do, so that gives you a kind of a, overview of some of the bats. You know, we have more than 30 species of bats that have been documented in the state of Texas, more than any other state in the country. Currently, we probably have between 30 and 31. A few of our bats have only been seen once. Um, so, th so those are not ones that we're going to likely encounter. But what I want to do now is kind of show you where they are in relation to where you are, okay, where you are in the state as a, as a chapter. Um, and some of them, of course, have a statewide distribution. These particular five, no sense in showing you a map of Texas, you know what it looks like. And these are five species that you're going to find anywhere in the state of Texas where you go. And that includes the tricolored bat. Now that may be changing, of course, because of some issues with it. The Mexican free tail bat has been documented across the state. Um, the silver haired bat and the Eastern red bat as well. And then the hoary bat is also statewide. Um, but again, it and the, the tricolored are considered S, S, uh, S2 and S3, or S3 and S2 respectively, in terms of their vulnerability. Now, looking at a few maps, and I want to thank uh, Wendy for producing these maps and literally producing these maps in, uh, I don't know, three hours, something like that. Uh, very impressed. <laughs> Skill I do not have. So again, thank you, Wendy, for doing that. Uh, this was a big help. So what this is, what these maps are, are um, uh, show all of the chapters of Master Naturalist across Texas. The green that you see, that is where this particular species can be found. So for example, on the big free-tailed bat, the Panhandle chapter, the South Plains chapter, the Llano Estacado, Trans-Pecos, Tierra Grande, and then the other chapters across the state where this bat has. So it's got a pretty wide distribution, not everywhere. But one of the things that will happen with as we are using doing these um, uh, acoustic monitors over time, will it connect? It may connect dots across the state in other places that we're not aware of at this point. But again, a fairly wide distribution for that bat. Here's the cave myotis. Um, it's a bat that you're not going to find in East Texas because there aren't a lot of caves out that way. So this is going to be restricted to those areas. But it's interesting to me that that South uh, Plains is not included, at least on the range map that I was referring to in Dr. Ammerman's Bats of Texas book, a great book, by the way, to learn more about our, our, our bats. Um, but it'll be interesting. Surely to gosh, they fly through this area. So that will be one of those things. And even down into here into the central Texas chapter, um, I would guess that there may be more locations where we'll pick these up on acoustic monitoring over time. And if we go to the western, just the western half of the state, we're going to find a couple of examples of pallid bat we've already talked a bit about, but you can see it's got a pretty wide distribution, just like the Townsend's big-eared bat does. Um, and when we're talking about acoustic monitoring, for example, the Hill Country, Hill Country chapter, as you all know, is a huge chapter. It extends from, you know, uh, 
uh, here in Bernie, the Bernie area, all the way out towards West Texas. So it's going to pick up a lot of bats because of the size of that that area, as are some of these other chapters out out west. So when you see those numbers, don't be surprised or disappointed. Just that they're covering a lot of land. Another West Texas bat is the Canyon bat, just to kind of show you its distribution um, and in terms of chapter locations. Now, I should say that right in here, um, there are no chapters. So that doesn't mean they don't occur here, but we're focusing where our chapters are located for this particular research, at least initially. Now, in terms of more West Texas, South Texas, we have a couple of species that you're gonna find there. The ghost faced bats down into the Trans Pecos again, but then over into the hill country, down into the brush, brushy canyons, uh, new chapter area, the brush country down in South Texas. Uh, same thing a little bit uh, for the Yuma Myotis, kind of a, a disjointed uh, range right in through that part of the state. But again, this is based on chapters, not necessarily only distribution. So then we have a lot of bats out in West Texas. And instead of providing you a map that showed uh, those, uh, the Tierra Grande and, and Trans Pecos chapters over and over and over and over and over again, we decided we'd just put them in the list. But you can see there's quite a lot of them right here. We have two bats that are critically imperiled at S1, the Western Yellow and the Long-Legged Myotis. We have one, uh, the, the uh, Greater Western Master, Ma Mastiff Bat. Um, that is an S2, and then these others that you see here, the spotted Western Mastiff, California Myotis, Western Small-Footed, um, uh, Fringed Myotis, and the Pocketed Freetail are all uh, considered S3 in West Texas. So then we have yellow bats. We actually have three yellow bats in Texas, but I got a map, two maps here of our Southern and our Northern yellow bats. I think at one time there was questions about whether the Southern and the Northern were the same species. Um, I've done a lot of bat netting over the years. The very first bat I ever took out of a net was a Southern yellow bat way down in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, pretty exciting time. Uh, but you can see their range is, is more towards the East and the South with both of these. And only the Southern yellow bat is listed as an SGCN uh, S3. And then we have the uh, Seminole bat, which is also an S3. And you'll notice it's more of a northeastern, generally northeastern, incorporates a lot of counties or a lot of chapters up here in this part of the state. And likely perhaps these, these chapters over here, uh, the Piney Woods, uh, the Lower Trinity Basin, Sabine Net Net Natchez, Natchez, sorry if I pronounced that wrong. <laughs> uh, we may find it that they're also in those particular parts of the state, but again, Sometimes we don't know what we don't know. Um, we also have others that are pretty widely distributed, but kind of more towards the northern or the eastern part of the state. That right? would include the big brown bat and the evening bat. Um, again, just gives you an idea that there are bats in every chapter across the state of Texas. And neither of these are SGCN. And then over in East Texas, a couple of them that are SGCN, the southeastern myotis, has a range very similar to the range of the Raffinisks uh, big-eared bat. Has a little bit more, another chapter or two added to it. But these are bats. Uh, this is, of course, the Raffinisks big-eared bat is famous for roosting in old, large, hollowed out trees. Um, and so these are bats that will be of concern to folks uh, in the Eastern third of Texas. And then of course we have nectar feeding bats. We've got two different species that are well known as that. And of course you have the pallid bat that I talked about earlier. Uh, and of course the nectar feeding bats are in uh, the two Western chapters out in the uh, Trans Pecos, um, the Chihuahuan desert area. And then we have three species of bats where there's just one single record. So we really, there's no sense in making a map. If we, if we encounter them, wonderful, but it's highly unlikely that these three bats would be found in our acoustic monitoring area. So now what's that mean in terms of your chapter and how many species of bats may be there and how many species of SGCN may be there? Well, we put that together for you too and, I, and I'm gonna leave this up for a minute so you can kind of find your chapter. And this is based on, again, on the records that I was able to glean from the Bats of Texas book and their range maps. So that this may, it may be off one species one way or the other. 
um, but we're pretty confident that this is what's at least on the range maps for your particular area. So um, uh, you'll notice that as the number of species goes up, the number of SGCN typically goes up uh, all the way down to where the uh, Tierra Grande and trans Pecos chapters have 22 species of which 17 of those are at some rank of SGCN. So that gives you an idea that every chapter in the state of Texas has something to contribute to this project to understand not only about generally about bat distribution for all species, but then specifically for SGCN species uh, that may be in your chapter's boundaries, if you will. So I want to show you uh, a report just came out uh, very short, uh, not very long ago on uh, the 2023 North American State of Bats reports from the North American Bat Conservation Alliance, a different group than what we're partnering with in terms of this acoustic monitoring, but a very important group. And of course, bats, and, and the reason we're interested in bats is because they provide so many benefits. You know, it, it, nowadays, when we talk about nature, a lot of people want to know, well, what, what, what good is it to us? And they want to know that from the standpoint of how much money is involved. So obviously bats provide all kinds of economic benefits through consuming insect pests, which helps not only improve crop yields, but hopefully reduces the amount of pesticides that need to be used to control, uh, otherwise control those insect pests. Um, and then of course the, the nectar feeding bats provide aid in plant pollination. Um, I always say, if you like, if you like, what is it, tequila? If you like tequila, you better thank uh, bat nectar feeding bats for their work. Um, of course, bat tourism here in parts of Texas is a very big deal for Austin, for San Antonio, for other parts of the state. Uh, so there's an economic game from that standpoint. And then just a scientific advan advancement in terms of what we've learned for medicines and for technology and things like that that come from uh, understanding more and more about bats. So very, very uh, important group of animals and definitely worth our um, uh, concern and interest in. And of course, there are threats um, that, that this report found. Uh, if you look at kind of by the numbers, 52%, and this is for North American bats, um, are at a risk of declining, uh, of decline. 82% are impacted by climate change, um, and 98% of those bats are losing habitat. Oftentimes, that's roost. Do remember that this report includes Canada, uh, United States, and Mexico, which is all part of North America. Um, so when you add in Mexico, there's a lot of species of bats in Mexico, which brings those numbers up. Um, top threats include severe drought, temperature extremes, the destruction of bat roost is a really significant one, uh, consumption of poison prey. And what that means is that when those insecticides are put on the landscape, if they're not outright um, killing the insects and the bats eat those poisoned insects, then that bioaccumulation of those pesticides, of those insecticides um, are going to have potentially a, 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 an impact on the success or the breeding of those bats down the road, short of just killing them outright over time. Um, mortality from wind turbines is a, is a major concern um, in Texas and elsewhere where bats fly. Uh, and then of course there's white nose syndrome. And I wanna spend just a few minutes, a couple of slides, on white nose syndrome to kind of bring you up to date as to where we are nationally and here in Texas. So nationally, uh, the, first of all, the disease that is uh, that fungus that's causing uh, white nose syndrome is called pseudogymnoascus destructans, um, and it afflicts hibernating bats. It literally across the United States, North America has killed millions of bats. I mean, multi millions of bats. Uh, in many places, you see 100% roost mortality. Um, and what happens, what happens is that, gets, that fungus gets on the bat, typically on the nose or around the muzzle or on their wings. It's an itchy sort of fungus that causes the bats to wake up and then they, does, they quickly use up their fat reserves. And over time, over the course of that winter, it can cause them to eventually starve to death. And that's what, where you get all that roost mortality. There are some bats that have survived it. So there's good news there. I should also mention that this disease was, is, uh, came from Europe. Uh, the bats in Europe apparently have adapted to it, but it was a novel disease here in the United States for our bats and it spread as this map is gonna show you, I put it into play here. 
uh, just watch how it spread over the last, uh, since 2006, when it was first discovered in uh, the United States. You can see the spread rapidly coming along. There's 2016, 2017, 2018, all the way up to 2022. You can see, unfortunately, it has spread all the way across the United States into Canada. Now, in Texas, hit another button here. Meanwhile, in Texas, uh, this is from this map is from a commission um, briefing that took place on January 26, 2023. Uh, those color, you can see the color codes, what those mean. I should tell you that we have not had the massive die-offs of bats here in Texas uh, from this disease, although we do know that, as I mentioned earlier, cave myotis uh, seem to be very, very impacted at this point, although there's still a lot of ongoing uh, efforts to try to figure out exactly what's happening there. But again, by the numbers, the first detection was in 2007 in the panhandle. Um, my uh, colleague, uh, Nita Brown from Old Tunnel and I were in 2008, were uh, testing Mexican free tail bats and actually found it one that was carrying the fungus. It didn't get necessarily get sick, but they can transport the fungus from place to place. And that was in 2008 down at uh, Old Tunnel State Park in, in um, uh, just north of Bernie. Um, there are seven th 37 counties where the fungus is known. 20 of those counties have confirmed white nose syndrome. Right now we know for sure that four species have been found carrying the fungus. And those four species include uh, the cave myotis, the Mexican free tail bat, the Townsend's big-eared bat, and the, the, the um, tricolored bat. Um, one, only one species so far has been detected with it, at least that was as of January 26, a year ago, and that was the uh, cave myotis. So it is here, it's probably not going away, and so the question is how do we, how do we manage this and, and, and uh, uh, also maintain our, the presence of our bats across the state of Texas. So I mentioned that we're going to be working with NABAT, which is the North American Bat Monitoring Program. It was actually begun in 2015-16 timeframe. Uh, the purpose of this program was to create a continent-wide program to monitor bats at local and range-wide scales for effective conservation decision-making and long-term viability of bat populations across the continent. So this is not a one-year deal. This is not a two-year deal. This effort is a long-term. The only way we get a better understanding of how species are doing is through long-term um, research and monitoring. Um, their goals are to were to develop and are to develop and maintain a long-term continental program to monitor bat distributions and indices of abundance at range-wide, regional, and local scales. They provide regular analysis and reporting on the status and trends of bat populations to inform managers and policymakers so that they can we can do our best that we can to manage bat populations. And so they inch, they are crunching data. They are putting out reports. Uh, they're not just sitting on data for years and years and years and only a few people know what's going on. Also, something that I thought was very noteworthy in their in this publication was the quote that the success of NABAT will likely depend on the use of citizen science vol scientists volunteers. So that they recognized early on that, hey, we can't do it alone. Biologists can't do it alone. It's going to take a, a village, literally a big village. And Texas, here in Texas, we've got the Texas Master Naturalist Program, and we've got a huge village of people, all of you out there, uh, and more that can help with this effort. So that's why we at the TNT program, we're, there's two of us. We're a pretty tiny little group. Um, but uh, we need to depend on a lot of other people, and that's why we've been working to put this together to reach out to the Texas Master Naturalist, because you have this opportunity to play a dramatic role potentially over the years with bat conservation uh, and knowledge about our bats in the state of Texas. So why are we, why are, why did they do that? Well, or why, what's the advantage of them doing that? And why do we want to be a part of it? Well, first of all, this is a, this is a status and trends map of bat summer occupancy for um, the uh, tricolored bat. You'll notice, that, and, and then this map is from uh, bats of Texas shows the range or projected range of the of the same bat, the tricolor bat. And you'll notice that in their um, status and trends, Texas is hardly part of that. 
that's because we've just got holes in our data. We just don't have enough data to be able to, for them to be able to make these, these uh, maps up. So that's again, another reason we're just, we, one of the things we need to do is collect good solid data so that we can not only have a better feel for where these bats are, but then also feed into the whole national picture of what our bats are doing. So we have a lot of data deficiencies here in Texas. And the way that they've set this program up, they have what are called grit cells. Uh, and what these are are 10 by 10 cells in, and they lined them out all across North America. Now they've actually got them out into the oceans and down into, uh, I mean, into parts of the ocean along the boundaries of North America. Um, so what these are, are 10 by 10 kilometer uh, cells and they're, they're placed all over everywhere in the United States. In Texas, we have 6,563 full cells and we have 655 partial cells. So they didn't make them to the specific boundary of Texas. They just made the grid and laid it over the entire country. Um, right now we have about 140 cells that have been um, um, adopted for different research projects that I could, the best that I could figure out. But how these work, so all of these are cells these little gray boxes you see here are adopted cells. So here's abilene right here. There are four cells that have been adopted through some research project. Can't tell you who that is, um, but those have been adopted. At least they were at that time that I made this. So how this works, and again, I wanna thank uh, Wendy for producing this, but these grid cells are all over the place. Here's Dallas right here. Here's Mesquite over here. Um, here's uh, Royce City. You can see that these squares that are outlined in red, those are what are considered priority um, uh, grits, grit cells. And, uh, but the other ones, the blue ones are also another level of importance. So they're graded out by number basically. So let's say that we have, and, and the reason I'm showing you this, let's say you're in the Dallas area and you have somebody in a chapter that lives out by a rock wall and it falls within this grit cell. This is a great opportunity to get a detector out in within this grit cell or multiple ones over time to get some data. But let's say that they don't fit right in with this here, but over in Garland, there's, a, there's some more people and you don't have a high priority cell, but you have a, another cell that's on a different level of priority. That's still a choice that we can, where we can get a detector out on the landscape to, to get some data collected for those scales, so uh, for, for those bats. So this just kind of gives you an idea of, of how this goes. So when, and the reason I bring this up is because there are so many of these, obviously we're not gonna be able to collect data in every one of them using Master Naturalist or you know, it's gonna take a huge effort beyond, even beyond that. But the more data we can collect and the more grit cells, the better our, um, um, efforts could be. And the idea is that if you're putting one out one year within a grit cell, the idea would be to put it out the next year and the next year and the next year, because that's how we start to build trend data on what the ha what's happening with the population. This is a map that shows current, um, this is came directly from their website that shows currently adopted grit cells. You can see they're scattered around the state of Texas, uh, but, with, but with a lot more that can be done obviously here. And this is a, just a graph that shows some of the species that have been um, actually documented in those grit cells, but then not a lot of them out there. So again, a lot of room for improvement. And this is where Texas Master Naturalists can come in and contribute so much to this effort. So within a grit cell, the idea is that there are four quadrants, five by five quadrants. And the idea is to get a detector, a, a monitor in at least one in each of these four um, quadrants to complete that grit cell. Uh, and th the idea of these arrows, uh, not to scale by the way, uh, the idea is to have these at least five uh, kilometers apart from one another. So if you have two master naturalists, that would be neighbors, one would get one. We wouldn't want to put one on, on the neighbors because they're probably it's the same information. So that's, that's one of our um, strategies is to spread these out as far and wide as we possibly can. The strategy that we that is used, the protocols that are used, and we'll review this later, is it's a four-night survey. You put it, you put the detector on the landscape on a Monday morning, you pick it up on a Friday morning, it gives us four nights. And so 
there are there have been efforts to put out detectors for months at a time or annually, and but the amount of data that is collected is so large that it's un, completely unmanageable. So this protocol, even though it's a, still a lot of data, um, as we're going to uh, <laughs> discover, I suspect, um, it's a little bit more manageable. And there are lots of times that the bats aren't flying in the middle of the winter. So there's no reason to have detectors on the landscape. So we have, there are protocols we will follow with this project and everybody that participates is expected to follow those protocols. The idea is to get one survey per um, location per year. If we can get two within a, in, in a year, um, within that two month time frame, then great. But if we can't, one is, is, is certainly adequate uh, to get us going. The other application that we want to keep in mind, and I'll mention it again, I'm going to mention it here because it popped into my brain, is we also want to look at habitat. So is it a, is it a, is it a within this particular example, if, if that's a river going down through here, it's actually a road, but if it's a river, we'd want to, that's a great habitat to sample bats in. If this is tall grass prairie over here, that would be one. If this is forest land, that would be one. So we want to try to sample as many different habitat types as we can in this process as well. So it sh this shows you that these are a couple of examples, and I apologize, the screen's probably a little small, but that's why you're sitting at home so you can put your head closer. Uh, you can see that these are just examples from two grit cells, uh, one with seven surveys in the lower left and eight surveys in the upper right, uh, that you can see they record, documented a lot of bats, including some of those bats that are in fact SGCN. So this is the type of data that can be generated. It's NABAT stores all that data, so it's public access, publicly accessible data, but that can teach us a lot about what's going on in the distribution of bats across Texas. So what we're going to initiate are, is something known as stationary acoustic monitoring. And the protocols for that are as follows. First of all, we're going to use two pieces, and I'll show you a photograph of them in a bit, uh, two pieces of equipment for our, as our monitors. One, are, one is made, uh, one's called an audio moth, and the other one is called a song meter mini bat. Um, and these are the two styles of units that we'll be using to collect data. Uh, and our goal is we, right now we have 25 of each kind that we hope to distribute at least one of each kind to the chapters that are interested um, across the state for use on a long-term basis, by the way. So again, in terms of the protocols, it's a one-week survey, Monday through Friday. Um, and again, I explained the reason we want to do that is because it's consistent that if you have that one model, then you're not having to cross compare data that comes from three months of data versus one week of data. It's not, it's not as easily comparable. And so that's why it is. Uh, right now, we're still in the process of determining what the time frame on a calendar year will be. Basically, we want to have them out on the landscape when bats are flying because it's spring. But we also, in this particular protocol, we want to get that surveys completed before bats become volant, which means the young are able to fly. So that's somewhere in the April, May, and June timeframe. I've gotten two different opinions. I'm working on some additional opinions before we finally decide uh, exactly what our timeframe will be. And of course, Texas being a Southern state, being a huge state, North and South and East and West provides some uh, additional challenges there in terms of timing. Um, we're going to, again, try to maximize ha habitat types within those grit cells, one monitor within each grit quadrant, and then monitors, again, are placed five, at least five kilometers uh, from each other. They always say that if you, if you only say it once, people forget. If you say it twice, people start to remember. That's, that's why that's there. Uh, it will require strict recording of monitor locations so that we know where that data came from. Doesn't do us any good if we don't write down where it was. Uh, and then also the storage of all of this data is also um, our bat biologists and other folks, we all recognize this is gonna be a real challenge is where do we put all this data? Because a bat detector can collect a lot of data in one night times four times 50 of those things out there on the landscape. It can, it can add up um, exponentially. So that will be a, a big concern that we have to deal with. Uh, data will be shared with NABAT, thus it's available to the public. I mentioned that. Um, also, in order to 
put those monitors on private land, which it, whether it's your five acres or 10 acres or your backyard, whatever it happens to be, it does require the signing of a TPWD agreement to share data uh, as public data. And, if, and so one of the limiting factors of the involvement in this project is if you want to put a detector on your property, but you don't want to share the data with the public, um, there's, you, we're not going to give you a detector um, because we're not going to wrestle with those kind of issues. Now, there are issues, of course, that come up. Say you have your property and you monitor for 10 years and then you sell it off. Um, then people are going to go, well, I don't want that data. Well, that data, it's, that's already done and gone. And, and uh, our lawyers and the powers that be have already figured out we might not monitor there anymore but the data was still protected because it was collected prior to the sale of that land. So those are all issues that have, that, that have to be thought out in the, on this process. And the goal, uh, based on a meeting I had yesterday with our bat biologist and with our former mammologist, um, who now runs overseas the non-game program, is to have a permanent data collection project through TPWD and the TMN program. So. Uh, once this, once we start rolling this out, it's going to grow and it's going to become a long-term project. And, and the reason we need it is because, again, as I mentioned before, if we're only doing it for a year or two years or three years, we get a snapshot, kind of like a glorified bio blitz, but we don't get enough information over the long term to know what's happening to populations. And so a long-term project is the only way to do that. So um, we're calling this a BAT. I think it was BAM on the one thing, but it's BAT acoustic monitoring with the T being the T in BAT. I, we're just playing around here. This is a, this is a process, so uh, don't, don't laugh too hard at that. But uh, I was trying to come up with something clever because uh, everybody likes those, those uh, acronyms. Uh, but there are different roles for the master naturalists. The first role will be a bat chapter coordinator or leader, and it could be one person, it could be two, maybe it's two or three, form a little committee, whatever. Um, we are kind of leaving that up to who we can recruit within the chapters, but basically that person's gonna be our point of contact with our TNT staff. There will be those volunteers that are acoustic monitor field deployment volunteers. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Um, I always say, why not say it in a thousand words when you know, if you even if you only need to have five. Um, anyway, so those are the people that are going to be getting the detectors and putting them out on the landscape. That's a lot of you, hopefully. Uh, then there will be a group of people, and maybe one, it may be two, it may be nobody from your chapter. Is a data review or, anal or analysis volunteers, and those are the people that are going to be helping us store the data helping us do the review of the data. It's gonna take a lot of effort to learn how to review the data through computer analysis and then manual analysis. There's a lot of online training involved with that. So that's not going to be for everyone. It's gonna be a more of a longer term commitment in terms of the amount of time required to help with that. And then maybe an optional role, we're still working on this. Um, somebody that every one of these detectors has to be programmed before they're put out on the landscape. It's not a hard com, uh, com thing to do, but we're, I haven't decided yet. It was brought up in a recent meeting, and I haven't decided if that's going to be a separate operation or if that's something we're going to try to do be prior to sending them out. Uh, this is, again, one of those uh, roles that is a um, uh, to be determined uh, uh, role. So in terms of the chapter coordinator or leader, you're, that person or persons will serve as the point of contact, again, with TNT staff. You're, that person or persons will receive and disseminate the acoustic equipment that we mail out or, or hand over. Um, we'll, that person will be verifying that the data collection is done within the time frame that we establish. They'll work with TNT staff to uh, identify potential public lands for monitor deployment. This is something that um, we've been you know, initially when we thought, okay, we've got these little detectors, we can get them out to people and put them on their property. Uh, but there are also another hundred or so, roughly, uh, larger units that come complete with, oh, you know, um, solar panels and batteries and the whole nine yards that can be put out on a more permanent basis. However, and those will be employed, 
The idea is to employ those or deploy them, if you will, on public land. So that could be state parks, could be wildlife management areas or other public lands that are out there where they can be placed securely. And it may be that those are also um, in conjunction with that particular site there may, if a chapter is in that area, they may be able to coordinate with, chapter members may be able to coordinate with that. For example, state park, make sure that that monitor is turned on and the data is collected when it's needed uh, each summer. So that's a whole nother aspect that I haven't gone into in great detail. Um, and that's probably a phase two sort of thing is, is we have to make a lot of contacts with those public lands, get permissions. We're hoping right now to at least be able to focus on TPWD public lands because we, think that that will be a lot less um, complicated, if you will, in terms of permissions and paperwork and that kind of thing. But we'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end. Um, and then um, uh, make sure the surveys are conducted. I think, uh, uh, I think I put that in there twice, just to reemphasize that. Uh, and then collect the monitors at the field season for safe storage. So we won't be leaving the, the monitors out there year round. So we don't want them that way it minimizes their damage. We got to have, we don't necessarily want them being mailed back and forth every year from all over the state. So it will be the job of that chapter to hang on to those monitors, keep them in safe storage so that we can deploy them the next year. In terms of the field deployment volunteers, there's will be more training. And I should say for the leaders, we'll have at least one other meeting, if not more. Uh, to, to as we get closer and closer to, to first year deployment. So there'll be contact between the T TNT program and, and the chapter folks um, throughout this process. For the deployment volunteers, this is where we need the bulk of helpers. Um, and this is to get with additional training to be able to program the acoustic monitors prior to deployment. That's part of that fourth job thing. Uh, determine the, lo they will, those people will determine the location for monitor placement in coordination with um, where the grit cells are and what are the priority cells and that kind of thing. So that will be, that will take a little time and a little coordination, but that, that will be important. And then of course, actually deploying the monitor on that Monday through Friday time schedule. Um, also completing, there's a survey form, I'll show you that in a moment. Um, a data sheet that has to be filled out for each location. Uh, and then also working with the coordinator to pass the monitor from one volunteer to the next. So for example, if your chapter has eight volunteers that want to put a detector on their property um, and you've only got two for the chapter, what will happen is that two, the first two people will get theirs out then they'll pass them, do their week, pass them to the next two and so on until everybody gets to, the chance to be able to, to, to gather data on their property. So that's, uh, and that will take some coordination, obviously. Uh, and that's where that coordinator person will play a role there. So in terms of the equipment I mentioned that we're gonna use, we're gonna use this Wildlife Acoustics Bat Mini Acoustic Recorder. It contains four batteries, an SD card, uh, and we program it. You can actually program this through our cell phone, put it out on the landscape and uh, turn it on and away it goes. The other one is the Audio Moth Acoustic Recorder. This little guy right here, it's literally, it's really small. So here, this is the case for that one, for the audio mod. This is the case for the uh, mini, uh, uh, bat mini acoustic recorder. So you can kind of see, hopefully you can see that. And then these are the more long-term permanent monitors. And when we say permanent in that it would stay in the ground, the detector would come in, but the, the setup would stay in the ground and we'd use it when we needed to. So in terms of deploying as, as uh, uh, Michelle was uh, mentioned uh, to you all. I need to take a drink of water here. Her family was willing uh, to put out some detectors at the Kerr Wildlife Management Area. I'm actually reviewing the data right now. Just to kind of field test how it went. And uh, except for some, uh, uh, you know, one slight mistake made by yours truly, uh, they worked really well. And we got lots of data. So we're looking at that right now. So, but this also gives you an example of uh, the kind of habitat that could be a, a, a place for uh, placing um, detectors near water, of course, would be one of the valuable places, but it doesn't always have to be near water, um, but certainly batch drink, so that's important. Here's that data sheet I, I said I would mention to you. 
And basically this data sheet has location, name, long, longitude, latitude, very, very important data. Uh, all of this is actually, and then also uh, more of, uh, not everybody does this, but the weather conditions. But if it's local and it's close by, you can do that. But if it's someplace that's 20 miles away from where you live, let's say you get one out on public land, it may not be as easy to do that. But this collection of data will be very, very important uh, to go with each one of the uh, monitors. And then we have the data uh, review analysis volunteers. There is a lot of really good online training through Wildlife Free, through Wildlife Acoustics, and, and um, also the NABAT uh, program staff to learn how to use a software program called Kaleidoscope um, that's sold by Wildlife Acoustics to do machine analysis, uh, cluster analysis, if you will, of bat data. Uh, and there's also another step once that's done, then doing some manual vetting of that data to try to make sure that the, the uh, machine analysis is correct. And there is, it requires a fair amount of training. I'm not gonna sit here and sugarcoat that. I've already attended three or four of those and I'm still learning. Uh, but it, the, the, one of the big jobs is that when those disks come in, proper labeling and storage of the data will be uh, one, of these, uh, one of the roles of these people. Um, and this person or person should have a head for computer software. If, if you are an engineer or a computer techie type, this might be your thing. If you're not, um, it may or may not be your thing. I would assume that out of the volunteers that want to get engaged, this will be the smallest pool of folk. But these will be in some ways very critical folk because getting through the data to get it to any bat will be our largest challenge in this project especially as more detectors are put out on the landscape over time. The software, just so you know, when you open up Kaleidoscope, this has to be Kaleidoscope Pro. Um, when you open that up, you'll, this is what it looks like. It, it seems like it might be overwhelming. It's not as bad. If I can figure it out, then, then I'm sure most people can. Um, and uh, one of the good things is we have this on our work computers, but we were able to receive a gift that allows us to get a couple of licenses that can, we, we will work on getting those out to people that are particularly interested in really diving into that. And there may be uh, more uh, of those available with time. But that's kind of a ramp up sort of thing as, as I see it. So what's the data look like when you get that data back? This is what it looks like when you download it to your computer in that software package. So you have an oscillogram and you have a spectrogram and these are the bat calls. These are the individual calls down here um, and each one of those uh, is, you know, you pick the good ones and you analyze them. And so you can stretch this out to flatten it out, to get more of a shape, to get, you can determine um, the number of milliseconds, that it, how long it is, uh, the height, the frequency, all of that. But it's that symbol that is gonna help us identify what bat that actually is. Now the challenge with that, and one of the challenges I wanna point out is that there are lots of different shapes of these bats, calls. And you'll notice, for example, up here it says steep with high bandwidth. This is from the Montana call uh, uh, training program that they, they do in Montana. Notice how similar these are. So you have to be really careful in your analysis when you're looking at them and vetting them to make sure that we get the right species. So this is not 100% guaranteed. There are bats that actually sound very similar to other bats. And so sometimes the best we can do is say, hey, it's one of these, it's likely one of these two bats or one of these two bats. So, so keep that in mind. So you have these, these couplets of bats, sometimes it may be three or four bats that all have a very similar call and you can't distinguish, but um, that's, a, a, that's one of the challenges we, we will face, and uh, I'm kind of up for that. I think it's kind of neat to be able to look at those things and, and try to figure that out. In terms of um, another phase of this project could be and most likely will become an, a, a mobile acoustic monitoring transect uh, project. So what we're doing is stationary transect or stationary monitoring. Acoustic monitoring, when you're out driving a road and you've got an acoustic monitor out recording bats as you drive down that road at night, gives actually more information on distribution than a stationary monitor does. 
but it also has its own challenges in terms of you've got to find a road that's safe you've got to find a road that has a speed limit that isn't excessive uh, that might be a, a road that's quieter, so it's not quite as, um, you know, you don't want to do this on I-10, for example, or I-20. Um, and so the roles that TMN, uh, you, you all might play this first year as we're ramping this all up, would be to actually help identify potential routes or driving the route as a check, and then potentially conducting some uh, surveys we don't know that for sure yet, but I wanted to put this out there so that you have this in the back of your mind. One of the things that um, we're contemplating is that some of you may know that every year uh, there are routes around the state of Texas where wildlife biologists go out and drive certain routes to monitor deer at night. And, and uh, we think that those routes that are already established may very well be great routes for this kind of um, mobile acoustic monitoring. So we're going to be, that's still in discussion. We're just literally, my thank credit to my wife, Terry, who uh, came up with this idea as we were sitting around talking about this project one night. So we'll be meeting very soon with a, a representative to see if that's even a possibility in terms of those routes. So this is another project that uh, another subset of this project that may be developing and most likely will be developed this year for full implementation in 2025. So just to go over the, a timeline here a little bit, um, we obviously today is we're doing an initial training and then we're hoping to sign people up as a result of this training. And we'll go through that here in just a few minutes. Um, many thanks to Mary Pearl and, and Michelle and their staff for putting that together, in, especially in short order. Uh, in February, um, once we've identified the initial chapters that are going to want to participate, have enough folks to participate and figure out the level of interest, we'll start to um, develop timelines for when uh, these things are going to be, we'll be able to answer those questions a little bit better in terms of deployment and monitoring. And we'll be meeting uh, online with chapter coordinators uh, as we go along this process. So um, the one thing I would say is be patient. Um, uh, there's there's two of us and, and one of us, Wendy's got lots of things going on too. So uh, we will get this rolled out, but we will, uh, uh, it will take, it will take an effort and it will take some time and some patience for, from all of us. Uh, but we really appreciate uh, appreciate people's interest. In March is when we will um, get the, the monitors ready to go out. There will be additional training. We haven't set a date yet. We will be doing that here in the next few days after we get registration in um, for how to deploy them, how to program them for deployment, the, the units themselves, uh, and then also do some initial training for data review volunteers, get th those folks started on that process, which will take a long time, uh, several weeks to months, depending on skills, to get that up to speed. And then April through May slash June will be the monitoring and placement of the, the uh, detectors out on the landscape. July, August will be, re, uh, will be return, as soon as we're done, whenever that is, we'll start retrieving the SD cards, getting them labeled, properly stored, the data uploaded, so that we can begin initial review of the data with us and with our uh, volunteers that are engaged in that aspect. And then hopefully by October, uh, November, we'll be able to get, and, and hopefully before if we can, submit, submit an additional initial data and uh, submit initial data and then write a summary report. And I can't tell you that this will all happen like clockwork. There may be uh, you know little hills that we come across that we didn't know were out there or stumbling blocks or fall off into a ditch for something, um, we, will, we will do everything that we can to keep this thing rolling. And uh, the one thing that I will put out there, and maybe this, sometimes people say this is a dangerous thing to do, but as we do this, if you see something that, that you think, hey, this could be done, could be streamlined better or that kind of thing, I'm one of those persons that I don't have all the answers. I am not the master of all of this in terms of knowing everything. So more eyes, more ideas, um, so that we can, now that doesn't mean we're going to agree with every one of them, 
but I'm not afraid to get additional ideas and, and comments and thoughts about this process as we go through it this first year. So what are the next steps for you as a TMN volunteer? First of all, um, complete the sign-up form. I'm gonna show you what it looks like uh, with the next slide. If you are interested in there, and we'll go through that in detail. Um, I would also encourage you to look up on the internet, uh, NABATS, a plan for North American bat monitoring program. It's a big document, but you can easily find it. Um, and there's the link to it if you wanna screenshot that while we're, we're sitting here. Um, and I would encourage everybody to read chapters one through four of that to get background sampling design, stationary point uh, acoustic survey protocols. And then if you're the data processing type person, you may also wanna read chapter six and then eight and nine. Uh, and if you're interested in the driving routes, that would be chapter, I believe it's seven, five or seven, one of those two. Then I'll tell you more about that as well. The other thing to start doing is start looking around, determining where you might place an acoustic monitor on the landscape. If you have 10 acres of land and you've got a big canyon going down through it, uh, or you've got a small pond or something like that, start looking around where those might be great locations to, to place a monitor. Um, and then also just keep checking emails because we're gonna, once we get this all together, we'll create a large email list that we can contact everybody at the same time. So everybody's on the same page at all times. Um, again, this is an opportunity to really help us out. And uh, we're looking forward to the, to the possibilities here. So this monitoring signup sheet, again, thanks to um, uh, your TMN uh, staff for putting this together shows uh, you're going to choose your chapter, of course, uh, like you do if you're ordering pins, if you were one of those people. <coughs> Shipping address is important, and it's important that you have an actual ad mail, uh, an address so that when we mail, depending on what service we use, end up using, we need a physical address, not a PO box, to mail those detectors to. So that's important. And that would be, um, uh, and of course, when we get coordinators, those would be the people we'll be mailing them to. And then there are the three different roles. There's the chapter coordinator leaders. There could be multiples, it didn't have to be just one. More power with more people, I think. Acoustic monitor volunteers, um, and each of you will fill this out in, uh, on your own. So you don't have to put multiple people down or fill it out for one chapter. And then the, the data review and, and, and analyst vo analysis volunteers, sorry about that. And then there's also a, a few other things. One is, why do you want to bring this project to your chapter? We would like to have some feedback on that so that we know how committed your chapter is. If it's going to be only one person in a chapter, that's probably going to get lower uh, uh, priority than a chapter that's got multiple people with a, a great deal more thought about it and interest. So keep that in mind. Um, what's uh, local state public properties do you have within your chapter's boundaries? So for example, if you are in, uh, in, in at the Lindheimer chapter, and I'll just use that because it's reference, it's close by, Guadalupe State Park and Honey Creek State Natural Area are within your boundary. Uh, that may be a great location. So helping us identify those potential locations that are public places would be most helpful to us and save us a lot of extra digging. And then also just to, to record, document whether you watch this um, uh, mini series live or recorded or both. So just some background information there for us. Anyway, um, that's the form, and uh, I, what I don't know, maybe we'll ask that question of Michelle and uh, Mary Pearl before this closes out, is when that will go live, um, um, and I, I'm getting close, we're getting close. It's another, live maybe, It's live now, thank you very much, thank you. So a few clothing, uh, clothing, clothing thoughts, you know, wear a uniform when you need to, no, uh, sorry, closing thoughts. This project has the potential to provide a great deal of insight into the distribution of bats across the Texas landscape. And I don't say that um, um, without great thought about it. It really does. We have a lot of information. We just, we've got old information. We don't have current information uh, for a lot of these bat species. And this is a project that um, you all have the opportunity to make a major, and I, when I say major, I mean major, positive impact on filling in those data gaps, which ultimately leads to better conservation outcomes for these species. 
again, I'll go back to it. If we don't know what we don't know, how do we make good decisions? So that's going to be really significant. And I think this can put a large feather in a cap that already has a lot of great feathers in it for the Mass Texas Master Naturals program. Because of this is being viewed as a long-term project, chapters will have the opportunity to participate in this potentially for years to come. So you may have some people that are interested in two or three years, but you keep recruiting and you, your chapter can continue over time to uh, generate data that's useful for conservation planning in this uh, for the bats of Texas. This first year is going to be a test year in that we're working out details, overcoming our challenges and helping create what I hope will be a sustainable and successful effort. Um, and that's where, again, your feedback will be most helpful. Some patience will be helpful. Um, um, and we will create something that is going to be a great model for what citizen scientists can do to collect valuable data that scientists can use to practice conservation for the benefit of all of us. I really believe we have the potential to do that with this project. That's what I'm going into it with. I do want to thank all of these various people for use of photographs or ideas or feedback, um, video, uh, just all kinds of things out there. This, this, this has been a, uh, something that's been going on, as, as Michelle said, at the beginning for a very long time, um, uh, for several months. And um, it's something that, uh, again, I think could be super, super awesome. So thanks to all of the folks on this list for that. And at the beginning of the, the event, uh, we mentioned this, uh, this survey, voluntary survey. There's that little thing again. This helps us with continue to get funding. And just so that if you want to shoot that with your phone right now, I'll leave that up for a minute. Um, you can take that. The survey literally takes a minute, um, maybe a minute and 10 seconds, something like that. Um, I tested it out one time when I attended a program, and it works very slick. And again, this, this is valuable information for um, our federal funders. So I would encourage you to take a screenshot of that. All right. I know there may be a question or two out there. So uh, this slide is based is for uh, Michelle and, and uh, uh, Mary Pearl. Thank you. And we'll see you next month at the next TNT event. Aren't these TNT Tuesday things? Wouldn't that be just a fantastic invention by these folks? So that is the end of my formal presentation. So I'm going to go over here and stop sharing right now. There we go. Hopefully that stops sharing. Let's see. Oh, so see here. What do you want to share? I don't want to share anything. Did it stop sharing, Michelle? It stopped. Yeah. Perfect. Move this over um. here. So we've got uh, there questions. There were there's all sorts of chatter in the chat, um, and <laughs> I'm having a hard time keeping up. Um, I know there's several of us um, working on chat. When you <laughs> might want to pop in and um, ask any of the things that haven't been addressed yet that maybe has been asked multiple times. Yeah, yeah great job, Craig. Um, we've had a number of people asking, is there an easy place to view that map of the GRTS grid map that the enemy got developed? Um, I, <laughs> yes and no. Yes. Um, <laughs> if you go to, um, if you go to their webpage, so look up, go to uh, Google or do whatever search thing you use. North American, uh, any, just look up any bat, North American bat, um, uh, whatever I said, my brain is, is quickly becoming mush after all that. Um, you can scroll around on the website. You can't, you have to create a project to be able to actually see all the grits to adopt the grits, but you should be able to go on there and, and probe around enough to be able to find that, um, um, but I would explore, it's a huge website with lots of information for public viewing and all that. So that's where I would go. That's I'm also willing to post links to your presentation today, Craig. Um, okay. Any additional links to, uh, on that TNT bat post that we okay. created on the Master Naturalist page. Do you, do you um, want me to just email the surveys? Do you want me to email those to you or how do you want me? To, okay. Whatever I will do works. That. 
passenger right. pigeon them and I will get them. Okay, well then they, you'll never get them. So I no. will, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll email them. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and Craig, we have another question just about general ecology of bats from Lisa. Mm -hmm. What are okay. the steps that we as master naturalists can take to help prevent or minimize the spread of white nose syndrome? Well, that's a great question. Um, as I understand it, if you, let's say you own property that has a cave on it and you know there are bats in there, the best thing you can do is, is to not be a regular uh, person going into that cave. I would, I would try to protect those cave entrances um, as, as best as you can. Um, because you'll never know when you have those fungus spores on you. So, for example, if you go to, and this is just, this is really out there, so uh, uh, people can scream if they want to, but let's say you went to uh, view bats at one of the bat caves, the public bat caves, and the bats were out flying around, and maybe, as I mentioned earlier, that Mexican free tail bats can carry the spores, even though they haven't been impacted by the actual disease. Uh, if somehow those spores become airborne and land on you and you go home and go, I got to go check out the bats in my cave. Um, you could inadvertently spread it. And that's what the, the thought was that that's how it got here was by cavers or by even maybe bat biologists that were doing research and didn't know they had the spores on them. So that the best thing to do is that also just not destroy bat roosts. Um, and then also make other educate educate people in your chapter about the importance of of protecting bats and minimizing that spread. So it's um it's one of those things. It's a little hidden thing that most of us are never going to see if we have one on, a spore on us or not. So uh, the best thing we can do is to be very careful when we're around bats, um, especially if we are associated with anything that's a, a, a potential roof site. Great, thank you, Craig. Um, we sure. had a lot of interest in this, and we had a few okay. TMN chapters chime in that while their chapter does not have a large state park in their boundaries, they have plenty of county and city parks. Um, on that application, can they provide that information instead of Please. the state parks? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead and do that. If, they, if they've got, if they don't have a state park or wildlife, and not everybody's going to, um, those other public locations may come in handy down the road. Um, what I would encourage you not to do, however, is to go and make contacts or assume that you can say, hey, I'm a master naturalist and we're going to bring a detector to you because we don't know that yet. So um, knowing who those are and if they can even put a contact, maybe the park manager or uh, the city official that uh, oversees parks or whatever, any of that information would be most helpful uh, for sure. Uh, but again, we want to take this in kind of a step-by-step -step process and not get out over our skis. Um, and I know master naturalists are an enthusiastic group, so so we want you to just kind of you know contain that enthusiasm <laughs> as, as, as we gear up, if you will. We had another so, call. Oh, oh, go ahead, Michelle. Sorry. <laughs> but, um, I was gonna ha ask about a different question in the chat. Um, was there anything, Wendy? Was there anything else related to nope. that follow up you wanted to go cover? Ahead. Okay, um, so there are some questions in the chat, Craig, about um, there's maybe a scenario where we're a chapter, um, we already have monitors um, that we're using like this, or we're a chapter and we'd like to get a set of monitors to use. So can you talk a little bit um, about what monitors might look like and in relationship to this project do you want people to use only the monitors that you are providing through the project if people have monitors that they already have would they need to be programmed towards this project um can you address some of those questions a little bit sure so there are a lot of different bat monitors out there there's a, there's these these units as i showed you earlier um, that come, now this unit right here, one of these with the case cost 800 bucks, just so that you know, it's not cheap. Uh, the, and that's the um, wildlife acoustics mini bat. This one costs around 100 with the case by the time you get everything you need, you need for that. But there are larger units um, that are much more detailed. Um, I, so that's, that's one of those questions we have to, things we, we will wrestle with. Um, so the biggest thing for us is going to be to stick to the protocol. And so the data that we gather that we eventually turn over to NABAT and to our bat biologist 
will be data from that one week protocol that we are implementing uh, across the state. Now you may have bat detectors that you're already doing some work with, more power to you. Um, if you want to, for that period of time, that about two month period of time, you want to redirect those, those um, bat monitors to collecting data following that protocol that we will be following and submitting that data for that purpose through your chapter, great. Um, I, I, that's certainly something we can talk about. But if you're collecting data year round or you're collecting data in the winter time or near roost or, or things like that, um, again, that's great, but we're gonna stick to the, the data collection um, methodologies that um, I outlined here today. So um, if you do have uh, detectors that you want to employ, let me know because that means I can share uh, more detectors with more people in other places. So uh, it's a win-win situation, but again, with the data management, we wanna to stick to our um, protocols that we're gonna use through NABAT. Hopefully that answers that question adequately. Um, yes, so I guess let, let, if I can help clarify or ask you first some clarifying questions. Um, sure. When projects, when chapters sign up for this project, you want them to use only the detectors that your your prod your program will be providing. Well, so that initially, yes, but but I, what I tried to say in that answer, maybe I didn't say it well enough, is if they have already have detectors that are acoustic monitor detectors that are exactly uh, what you're already you will be providing. Exactly, yeah, and there's only a few that actually do bats. So um, you know, if if it's if it's a detector you can put out on the landscape for four days or, you know, on a Monday morning and pick up on a Friday and leave them there. Not those, not those detectors that you plug into your phone. Okay. There's one that's made by wildlife acoustics. You plug into your phone and you can walk around and listen. We're not going to use that kind of detector. We're going to use the field detectors that are out there. And these are two styles. There's actually others by wildlife acoustics are even bigger. Um, uh, those are the ones. So it's got to be something that will be left out on the landscape for four nights over a five-day period of time. Um, and I and I and I have. Hang on, I can. I think maybe I do. Uh, I don't. I don't know where it is. I have one of those little handheld things you plug into your phone, um, and those are great. But those are not what we want to use for this particular project. So it would need to be a field-based detector. Hopefully that helps clarify that a little more. Um, <clears throat> and then there's, you might wanna go back to your slide where you defined the roles of the chapter. So there's a question in the chat about how many people from the chapter it, do you recommend for helping with this project or managing the project? It's a great question. Um, we need, so what we definitely need is at least one person, if not two, that can oversee this within their chapter. So, um, and again, I, I, I say it could be one, it could be two, it could be three. You could form like a commit, a, this could be a, become a project in your chapter where you have 15 people that are engaged in this particular project. Um, an example of that would be uh, some chapter, we've had chapters that do uh, camera trap projects. There's one going on in Alamo right now and there's about 12, I think around 12, 14 people engaged in that. And that's one of their things. So this could be that where you 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 pool all your research, your human resources together. Say how many people want to do this. You get 15 hands raised. Then you sit down and you review this presentation and the different roles. Come up with who's going to do what. Reach out to me if need be, and I can sit down on an online meeting with you and and go over it again. And then that way we can get the coordinators, uh, the people that are the point of contact, figured out. And then from there, we have the people that will deploy them. And then if there are anybody, if there is anybody that wants to do the data analysis stuff, then we'll have that as that third group, that third core of people that are involved in that chapter. So I don't want to say that, that you can't have 20 people. Um, the more people you have, just keep in mind that we're probably looking at an eight week survey process, I think, of having the detectors on the landscape. So there's, there's a time limit for how long those will be out. And you, again, you may only have two of them in your chapter, depending on how many chapters are, are engaged. 
So you're gonna have to share those. So you can only do two people at a time and moving it around the landscape within your chapter. And then also following the protocol within the grit cells. So those are variables that keep me from saying you need X number of people. But I would say if you only have one or two people that wanna do this, I would encourage you to try to recruit more members of your chapter because um, it's not impossible for that to happen, but, but we're gonna prioritize chapters that, that have, have sat down and really thought this out a little bit and got people uh, pooled around together within their chapter to, to make this happen. Um, again, I, yeah, that's, so I, I don't have a definitive answer for that. I can't, I can't say five, I can't say 10. But your chapters, I have to decide if it's a one person who says, I've got this, I want to do this, and I'm going to do everything, that's probably not realistic. We're also um, getting a few different questions about the quadrant system mm -hmm. um, and how many detectors, based on the quadrant system, and how many detectors would be deployed to an interested chapter. Um, and so could you go over the quadrants? Um, the movement of the monitors um, and the number of monitors that would be sent to a chapter participating in the project. Okay. Um, can I go? Do you mind if I share the screen again? Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, you yeah, should have. I, yeah, I'll, just, I'll, I'll do that because I think that'll be easier to do it that way. To go back to that slide. So bear with me just a second here. We know I want this one. Share. Okay. Is that popping up? Yes. Okay. So let's go down to that very slide. Okay. So as this shows, so here is one, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, this is one 10 by 10 grit cell. Um, and each within each one, there is a, or there's four quadrants. The idea is to get two to four detectors, one per block. So each one of these is a block. There are four blocks. Let's use the same terminology there. So, um, if that's a five by five kilometer block and somebody's up here in this upper corner, upper left corner with a detector and somebody wants one that's down in here and it's five kilometers away, ideally, we could put one there. So that's, again, there's only so many you can get in a block simply because of the, the, the distance that they would prefer they be apart. So that's why if we can get a minimum of one per each of these quadrants, these, these blocks, um, that would be ideal. If there's a way to squeeze in more with the detectors that they're going to get, which again, initially, if all 49 chapters wanted to participate, you'd each get two detectors to share and move around from person to person. But let's say there's only 10 chapters that initially start out. We can get maybe three of them or four of them per chapter. You could then do that. You could do more detecting or more uh, data collection within that uh, particular quadrant. Or those particular quadrants, if that makes sense. Uh, but initially, uh, we will. We, our goal is to get two out. We know we can do two, and if we can get more, we will get more out to those folks. Um, and again, part of the job of the coordinator is to go. Okay, I'm giving. I've got six people here. Uh, a and B get the first run at it, and then when they're done, they're going to pass it on to C and D, and then they're going to pass it on to E and F. Um, to collect that, to, to get that route out. So that will be, that's where the communication between us and them will be very important because we, to coordinate where they're going to be located on the landscape um, within those cells so we don't have them right on top of one another because um, then, then we're just duplicating data um, unnecessarily. <clears throat> Does that help? Yes, and then there's a question about height of at what height do the monitors, should the monitors go? And so, just, uh, and as a reminder, like all of this is yeah. covered, uh, will be covered in the deployment um, training, uh, yes. training and info sheet that comes with the monitors as well. There you go. Ideally, they say to put them on a tall post, maybe uh, 10 feet off the ground. 
Um, uh, but it doesn't have to be if you don't have that. The biggest thing is to make sure that it's not, um, th that the microphone is not facing, for example, directly into a bunch of trees where if a bat flies by, you get, um, you get uh, duplicate sounds um, involved there. But putting them high and out in the open is what's, what's recommended. So it could be the top of a T-post driven into the ground. It could be, you know, if you had a piece of PVC um, that was eight or 10 feet and sink it into the ground a couple of feet, put it on the top of that, uh, that could work as well. So um, six to 10 feet would be ideal, but it is not a requirement. What I would suggest not doing is putting it onto the trunk of a tree that has, you know, like a live oak with a bunch of branches hanging down off of that. And again, you're right, we'll go into that in more detail. Uh, because it's not going to, it's going to have so much interference. You're going to get so much background that you're not going to get a lot of good recording. So you want it exposed in the open. Like, like that photograph that, um, let's see, Michelle, where was that photograph that had right there? So that's a great setting. If, you, if the detector is on one of these fence posts back here and it's facing out into the open, you're going to get a lot more, uh, you're going to get a lot better results than if you take it and face it towards those trees on the other side of the fence line, if that's, if that makes sense. All right. I, did you get muted? Did, did I? Uh, no, I just stopped talking. Now you're back. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I did. So that's what I've got for that answer. Hopefully you heard all that. Okay. Yeah, and then the, there is there a deadline to complete the interest survey, which we really didn't talk about that. But. We did not talk about that, did we? <laughs> oh, actually we did kind of talk about yeah. that. So, yeah. So initially, if I could get folks to get signed up, what is it? January 20. Third, if I can get people to get uh, that are interested get signed up by um, February 15th, uh, that'll at least know what my initial group of people is going to look like. Um, but there, I, over t because this is a long term project, I would expect other people may come from a new class that are interested in getting involved. So we'll have to figure that out. Um, whether we leave this live, I'm okay with leaving this live and people can I make a suggestion, do. maybe Craig, since absolutely um, we are yeah. looking for chapter involvement in this, right? Yeah, um, maybe give a little bit longer. Um, oh, okay, a February 15th wouldn't even give um, a whole month. So, if some okay. chapter boards need to take action, oh, right, um, right, on approving it as a, as a project or um, having more information, we want to give them enough time to be able to do that. So, so would March 1st be a better deadline or is that still a little too soon? Do you think? Yeah, I think March would work end of February, early March. Yeah, yeah. let's, let's say March 1. Because we've got to have time to get everything. Other people trained up with the other things and all that. But as people sign up, once I get a chapter, that's got people, a, a bunch of people, a group of people interested. I'll start reaching out to those chapters and we'll, we'll start um, that ball rolling so that we don't wait till everybody. Uh, uh, is in there, if, if that makes sense. I think that makes sense to me. Okay, um, there's a number of us that have um, commitments and appointments that start at one o'clock. Um, are there, is there any final parting thoughts you'd, um, or take home, home points you'd like to provide Craig? Yeah, I would just say um, thank you all for attending this. I would say that if you have any interest at all, talk to other members of your chapter and see if you can generate enough interest to get a group of people together. Um, you can always reach out to me with more questions. Um, uh, let me put my email in the chat um, so that you can reach out to me directly with more questions if you have them and I'll do my best to answer them. There, it's in the chat now. And um, I really look forward to the possibilities of working with the chapters across the state. I think this has got the potential to be massively uh, beneficial and uh, program for bat conservation in Texas. And, and um, 
I am one of the biggest advocates for master naturalists and what the possibilities are for what you all, all of that you already do and what you can possibly do. And, and so um, uh, you will not find a bigger cheer. Well, you probably will. I mean, there's, there's two of them right here, three of them on here right now, but um, I, I love working with master naturalists and I hope that um, we can uh, work together to make this a very successful endeavor for, uh, for the bats uh, and the future of bats in Texas. So, Thank you all so much for attending, and uh, I will look forward to working with you over the course of the next uh, the next years. And as a and thank you for allowing us to do this too, Michelle. Absolutely, anytime. And as a reminder, um, this session is being recorded. We will have the recording on our website under the TMN Tuesday tab on our website um, by this time tomorrow. Um, We're also planning on having a PDF of Craig's presentation, any other links that are pertinent to the project and the presentation. And, um, all the information about that, this presentation can be found on our TMN Tuesday page on the website, hopefully by this time tomorrow. So um, thanks everyone and have a great rest of your week. And don't forget to tune in for our other uh, TMN Tuesdays coming up in February as well. So another two of them coming up in February again, too. Take care, everybody.